Any questions about anything? No? Questions? Any questions? Yeah. Are you celebrating back to the future today? Yeah, it is. I, you know, I... I only ever saw the original movie, and I only ever saw it once, if you can believe it. So, anyway. I should really watch it again, just to see, like... You should watch the first two, the third one's like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The third one's scratching their little bit, but... Why don't you record that out? Any other questions? Yep, yeah, Alex. There's a key in the ceiling there, in the office. Key in the ceiling, ooh. Oh, whoa. Uh-huh. Never noticed the key in the ceiling before. Probably not. Yeah, I mean, it looks, from here, it looks as if that, that light should be, should occlude the key for you. <laughs> That's a technical term for an image processing, occlusion. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions? These are all good questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk. We're going to. I'm going to try to talk with you about wavelets a little bit. And like I said, uh, this is something I've never really tried to do in class before. So it's going to be an adventure. First time through anything is that way. So we, we started talking about wavelets. Now, what, what is the overarching picture of wavelets? Essentially, wavelets give you other ways of doing orthogonal expansions of signals. So at base, wavelets whatever they are, give you new ways to do orthogonal expansion of signals. Now, we, we've seen already <clears throat> one instance of orthogonal expansion of signals, and that was periodic signals. Okay, periodic signals so one sort of instance of signal representation by means of orthogonal expansions that we've seen already. And this is not a, <coughs> a wavelet-based way of doing things, but it's historically important, is Fourier series. for periodic signals. <clears throat> and another kind of signal representation that we've seen that isn't quite an orthogonal expansion, but is sort of like a continuum version of Fourier series, at least I tried to pitch it that way, is the Fourier transform, and specifically equation script F inverse. So another instance of signal representation that's kind of like a continuum version of Fourier series is this Fourier transform, specifically equation script F inverse. So it comes from equation script F inverse in the Fourier transforms. You have x of t equals this continuum superposition of complex exponentials and the Fourier series, this is a discrete superposition of complex exponentials, and it's actually technically an orthogonal expansion. Okay, so these are ways of representing signals. Why would you want new ones? Okay, so that's a big question. What's missing from these? So here's a question. Why might you want quote unquote new ways to do this? to represent signals, either as orthogonal expansions or some other way. <clears throat> 
And that kind of a question, you can address it in a negative fashion. You can say, what's missing from what I do now? Or you can address it in a positive fashion and say, what would the coolest possible way be to represent the signals that I'm going to be dealing with? Okay. Oh, Ricardo's here today. Awesome. Hey, did you watch the video from last time? Uh, oh, it's not up yet. Okay. I totally called you out. No. All right. <clears throat> anyway, so you can address this question either as what's missing from what we do now or ideally speaking, what, what do we want to have? Okay, so what I want to do is I want to go through both of those things. And, and I want to frame it as follows. The basic idea of a signal representation. So here are basic desired properties of any signal representation method. And of course, there are more than these, but these, I think, go without saying as being important. And keeping in the back of your mind the kind of signal representations we've seen before, Fourier series, I mean by the signal representation by Fourier series, I mean the list of Fourier coefficients. <laughs> by the sig signal representation by Fourier transforms, I mean the Fourier transform as a function of omega. Okay? So, a signal representation method is going to have signals, and it's going to have other way of describing signals, and that's the representation. Okay, so first off, I would say that you, you want to be able to, by looking at the representation, like in the case of Fourier series, it would be the list of Fourier coefficients. In the case of continuous time things with Fourier transforms, it would be the Fourier transform. By looking at the representation, you want to be able to tell sort of at a glance some salient properties of the signal. You want that representation to sort of present to you in a convenient, compelling way salient properties of the signals. So we want the representation to exhibit prominently in some sort of easy to, to see way salient signal properties. That's one thing we want. We also want the representation, if you think of the representation as giving us, if you do a sort of a finitary version of the representation versus the whole thing, we want that to, in some sense, converge nicely to the signal. Okay, so we want sort of partial representations. And think here of sort of the partial sums of a Fourier series. as a kind of a paradigmatic example of such a thing, to quote unquote, whatever this means, converge nicely to the signal as the length of the partial representation goes to infinity. And that's something we would want to have. And that sort of goes without saying from an analytical standpoint. But it's also related, this, this is related to the issue of data compression in the following fashion. Okay, so note that this is related to data compression as follows. In real life, we can only represent things in a finitary fashion. We, we can't ever sort of, well, we can, we can pretend that we have an infinite number of things available and all that sort of thing. But to send something, say, from point A to point B over a communication channel, we have to send a finite array of numbers. You know, we have to pretend we, that the signal is a big, long vector. That's what MATLAB does all the time. And so if you want to represent a signal in a way that is data-wise economical, you want a few coefficients, so to speak, a few terms in the representation to provide a really good idea of what's going on with the signal. So basically, you want, want representations that give sort of good approximations of signals using relatively few 
quote unquote terms in the representation. So if you think back to Fourier series, relatively few terms in the representation, you, you want it, you would wish, say, Fourier series happen not to do this, as a matter of fact, and I'll show you in the instances of that. You would want to be able to only send, say, the first 10 Fourier coefficients to somebody and have them be able to reconstruct the periodic signal pretty well. Okay, that's the kind of thing you want to do. And another thing is, and this is, this is also kind of related to data compression, but it's more about figuring out the representations from the signals and figuring out the signals from the representations. We want that to be computationally efficient. Okay, so we want to be able to go back and forth between signals and their representations in a computationally efficient way. Is there going to be some clever algorithm for computing the coefficients in the representation from the signal or vice versa? And this, this kind of computational efficiency desideratum is related as in, in an essential way to what we do with the FFT. Now, later on in the class, we we're going to talk about the DFT and the FFT. And the FFT turns out to be a kind of a discrete version of a wavelet approach to something. And it's kind of interesting to view it that way. And I don't know whether I'm going to have time in class to do it that way, but I'm going to try to write it up for you. Okay, so those are things, those are basic desired properties you want of any single representation method. Now, what is missing from Fourier analysis with regard to these three things? Let's look a little bit at that. And last time I, I kind of gave you a, a preview, a trailer, so to speak. Now, everyone's seen the Star Trek, uh, the uh, Star Wars trailer, right? Have you seen it? No, yes. Thousands of times. Yeah, one of the TAs sent me an email and said, uh, on my TA contract thing, thingy, it said I had to stay in town at least 48 hours after the final exam. But um, I have tickets to see the Star, Star Wars movie in New York City like 36 hours after the exam. So I'm wondering if you would mind if I left. I said, oh, no problem. Go ahead. I'm going to grade the final exam. So, so anyway. OK, so anyway. So uh, regarding these things. How does Fourier analysis fall short here? So how does Fourier analysis fall short? Well, item one, this is, this is the one I was talking about last time. Think about a finite duration, A440. OK, so suppose x is a finite duration A440. For example, x of t, so x has specification, x of t is equal to cosine 2 pi times 440t times pa of t for some a bigger than 0. This is the one we analyzed earlier. We found out that the Fourier transform of this is a sinc function, right? That spectrum, the spectrum of x, x hat of omega, is some sinc function. It turns out to be real. OK, so what if I take x and I shift it by some amount of time? So it turns out to be real. But that doesn't matter particularly. So consider shifting x by some number t1 bigger than 0. That is to say, y equals shift t1 of x. What is the spectrum of y going to be? By the time shift rule, y hat of omega equals e to the minus j omega t1 x hat of omega for all omega. 
So what does that mean? That means that the, the magnitude, no matter how big T1 is, T1 could be 10 to the 59th years, it could be 6 milliseconds, whatever. No matter what size T1 is, so thus for all T1, and it could be positive or negative, but I'm taking it to be positive, y hat of omega magnitude and x hat of omega magnitude are the same for all omega. And you can think of this T1 as representing the time of occurrence of the finite duration A440 in a given signal. And you can imagine some minimalist composer, say Steve Reich or Philip Glass or whatever, John Cage, you know, some avant-garde minimalist composer, composes two different, two vastly different pieces as follows. One of them, the person plays a finite duration A440 for three seconds starting at time zero. Another one, the person plays a finite duration 440 for three seconds starting 20 minutes later. Those are very different pieces, right? I mean, they're sort of similar in a way, but, but they're very different. And if you just look at the magnitude of the spectrum of those two signals, you can't tell them apart. You can't tell when the finite duration A440 occurs from the magnitude of the spectrum. You have to look at the phase. So to answer, if you're given the spectrum, y hat, perhaps as some data file of magnitude and phase values, and I'll put data file in quotes, to figure out when the finite duration A440 occurs, so to find T1, which is the time of occurrence, of the A440, what you need to do is look at the phase, okay, and figure out the omega derivative of the phase. Because the phase, remember, only comes modulo 2 pi. So what you're going to have for your phase data file is going to be a bunch of values like this. They, they're going to be arrayed like this. And you're probably going to only have discrete samples of these things. But the point is, T1 is minus the slope of this. So we need to essentially find the omega derivative of the piecewise linear phase. And you can see right away that the bigger T1 is, the steeper the slope is, and the more likely it is that your data file is going to sort of skip some of these branches. And so it's not going to be clear whether you're on the same branch when you're computing the derivative. And to do this, this requires for large T1, if you think about it, this requires much too much, too much precision in your phase data. And another way of stating that is, for any given precision of phase data, I can give you a T1 big enough so that you cannot figure out T1 from that data file of phase data. Okay. So the bottom line is, looking at the spectrum in any kind of presentation that you would see, some data file of magnitude and phase, or even a graph that you had to sort of manually figure out the slopes of, would not give you, would not point out the most salient thing about this signal, which is when the finite duration A440 occurs. So that's the moral of the story. And 
what we need, therefore, we, we want to have some kind of representation that gives us both time and frequency content information. So the moral of the story is that, that the Fourier transform doesn't, doesn't exhibit prominently whatever the T1 value, which is, in some sense, the most salient feature of this signal. And in general, if you look at a general musical composition, if you take a composition, if you take, say, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or whatever, something more, less John Cage-ish and Philip Glass-ish and whatever, and you just make a big list of all the notes and all the durations in that symphony, and you throw that list into a shuffler of some kind and come out with another list and then put down the notes in that new order. Remember, same durations, same notes. The resulting very different musical piece is going to have the same magnitude spectrum as Beethoven's Ninth Symphony does. It's just going to have different phases. So all the info about how that symphony actually sounds is buried in the phase. All the sequencing information. And we saw, last spring at least, in 2200, and anyone who took that class using the book by McClellan et al., they talk about a way of getting around this, they, without talking about Fourier transforms even, they say, here's this, this thing called a spectrogram. And it turns out that's a step in the right direction for understanding musical pieces better. OK, so the spectrogram. From, if you want to look back, CC2200, the early days of that, is a step in the right direction. Remember, we, we said that this gives, you can actually think of a sheet of music as being a spectrogram, a very abstract representation of the spectrogram of that music. And it's a step in the right direction in the sense that it gives sort of a time slash frequency representation of the signal, of the musical piece that you're talking about, or whatever. And like I said, it's a step in the right direction, but it's still, there's some problems with it that, with regard to items two and three up there, that, that make it not the ideal solution. Okay, but there are better ways to do this. I'll put better in quotes because that's a value-laden term. And I don't mean to give my summary endorsement to anything in this class. But anyway, OK, so that's one thing. That's item one. What's missing from Fourier analysis is the answer to the question, when did the finite duration A440 occur? It's very hard to figure out <clears throat> with any kind of finitary specification of the data. OK, so item two. We we want the partial representations to converge nicely to the signal. And this is related to data compression. So, so let's think about that. Let's think about, say, the Fourier series as something that where you can make good sense of partial representation. It's just the partial sum of the Fourier series. And Keeping that in the back of our mind, suppose we have a signal x. So as far as item 2 goes, suppose we have a signal x that has finite duration. So say x has finite duration. It's a decent signal. It's an L2 signal, whatever. It's going to have a Fourier transform. So equation script f inverse represents x as this kind of a thing, 1 over 2 pi integral from minus infinity to infinity, x hat of capital omega e to the j omega t d omega for all t. And this x hat of omega won't have 
finite duration in omega space. So that was one of our results. The signal can't be both band limited and finite duration at the same time. OK, so you've got this x. It does something, and then it's 0 outside of some interval. And here we are representing it as an, a continuum superposition of e to the j omega t terms that take into account arbitrarily high values of omega just to make things cancel out just right so that outside of the interval where x of t is non-zero, you get 0. It seems rather inefficient. OK, so this seems rather inefficient. almost like overkill or whatever, that we're figuring out way too much stuff to represent x. So it seems, at least to me, inefficient to, to sort of quote unquote sum a whole uncountable continuum. And that's actually kind of a redundant term. So I'll put uncountable in parentheses of terms. And I'll put terms in quotes because in, I'm thinking of each omega as corresponding to one term to do something which is essentially to get x of t to be 0 outside of some interval, which is essentially what we're doing and to get the thing to converge to x of t inside that interval. So here, here's an idea. Here's a different way of representing a finite duration x. We look at where x lives. We look at where x has non-zero values. And then we bound that by some t0 as follows. So we pick capital T0 so that x of t is equal to 0 when t is bigger than or equal to t0 over 2. Then we take x and we generate a periodic signal as follows. So form a T0 periodic signal, X sub R, by means of the prescription x sub r <clears throat> is equal to the sum over all n in the integers of shift sub n t0 of x. So like, for example, if x looks like this, say something like this, and this is t0 over 2, then x sub r is going to look like this. It's just going to look like zillions of copies of that same picture over there. Let's see if I can duplicate it. Centered at integer multiples of t0. OK, now. What we're going to do is we're going to expand this x sub r in a Fourier series, but just ignore what's happening except in the interval where x is non-zero. So what are we doing here? We're expanding x sub r in a Fourier series. <coughs> 
note that x of t and x sub r of t are the same when t is less than or equal to t0 over 2. Thus, x of t is equal to the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of ck e to the jk omega 0 t when t is at that interval and 0 when t is outside of that interval. <coughs> and so now we have a sort of a discrete representation of x of t. You can actually write this as the sum of ck times e to the jk omega 0 t restricted to the interval t0 over 2 and 0 outside of that. So I'm going to rewrite that as follows. The sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of x, inner product wk, wk, where actually I need an of t there. So where wk of t is just equal to e to the jk omega 0 t when t is less than or equal to t 0 over 2 and 0 when t is bigger than t 0 over 2. And note that this set of wk's as k runs over the integers is a complete orthonormal set. in the set of all signals, decent signals say, that vanish outside of the interval minus t0 over 2 to t0 over 2. So let me call that d of minus t0 over 2 up to t0 over 2, the set of decent signals that are 0 for t bigger than or equal to t0 over 2. OK, so what I just said is, what, what I went through this was that we have a priori, we, we've only been able to represent periodic signals with Fourier series, but here we're using a Fourier series idea to represent a non-periodic, a finite duration signal, which ostensibly we only had the Fourier transform representation before. This is good in the sense that we've reduced it to a countable bunch of terms rather than this uncountable continuum of terms. But still, it turns out it's not that good from the point of view of convergence. That these things don't tend to converge very nicely, especially when the signals x that you're dealing with have edges, corners, jumps, things like that. So again, we've got a step in the right direction. OK, so this is quote unquote better than equation f inverse but still it turns out and I'm not going to go into the details here that these kind of expansions in terms of complex exponentials don't behave as well as we wish they would behave near jumps and corners of signals so when signals have jumps So when a sing when let's make it singular when a signal x has jumps corners etc this series doesn't converge quote unquote as nicely as we wish it would 
near those junction corners. And how many people, we, we didn't talk about this in EC2200 last grade, but how many people have heard of the Gibbs phenomenon associated with the Fourier series? When did you learn about that? Diffie Q? Yeah. Well, Gibbs, did you know who Gibbs is? J. Willard Gibbs? He's the same dude as Gibbs Free Energy, right. But he, he was a math, pro yeah? We talked about that? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow, I don't remember. That's terrible. Anyway, the, the, this is an example of the Gibbs phenomenon is something that you can't avoid. So what does this say? For example, the Gibbs phenomenon <clears throat> And J. Willard Gibbs, remember, who is he? He was, he was a math professor at Yale, and some people call him the first American mathematician. Now, I don't know how you define the word mathematician, but there must have been others before him that did math, you know, for fun, whatever. I don't know. Maybe he was the first one who did it for money. But anyway, Gibbs Free Energy, that's also from him. So you took thermo? But you just know that from... Physics, okay. All right, so the Gibbs phenomenon says the following, that if you have a jump in a signal, if, if X has a jump, say, that looks like this, then the partial sums of the Fourier series around that jump are going to converge pretty nicely along the, the flat parts. But right at the edge, they're always going to overshoot or undershoot by about 9%, even in the limit. So all partial sums, no matter how big, overshoot or undershoot so let me put an arrow down here to this one by about nine percent at the jump, around the jump. And uh, similar kinds of weirdnesses occur at corners. And you may say, well, wait, doesn't our theorem say that it converges for all t except for the points of continuity and converges to the mean across the jump? Well, yes, the theorem says that. But the partial sums, what happens is that this little blip gets narrower and narrower and narrower. So it doesn't affect what's happening for anything that's not at the jump. But the peak of it is always about 9%. And when it's 9%, it's 9% of the height of the jump. So if the jump is, say, 10, then it's 0.9, for example. So that's an example of a weirdness that we wish we didn't have for Fourier series. So again, again, this is a step in the right direction from equation script F inverse, but there's a better way. There's, there's a better way to do this. And in terms of computational stuff, just sort of wave my hands about this one, but it's pretty clear that if you have a signal x and it's Fourier transform x hat, so let's go back to the Fourier transform stuff, then to figure out x hat, you have to use all the values of x. To figure out x, you have to use all the values of omega. Okay, so, so computation-wise, We have the following. For all omega, the value of x hat of omega depends on the value values of x of t for all t. And similarly, for all t in the reals, the value of x of t depends on values of x hat of omega for all omega in the reals. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a signal representation kind of thing that was more localized? 
in the sense that if x is localized in time and in, we can calculate what the, the representation coefficients are in an easy way, if x is, x is localized in frequency or whatever that means, we can do things with more, fewer computations. So it would be nice. And it's really hard to get specific about what the target is here without telling you what wavelets are already. So you know you just have to look back at this and say, oh, that's what he was talking about. Or maybe you won't. I don't know. We'll see. It would be nice to have, have a sort of signal representations that are computable, quote unquote, more locally using only local information about the signal or local information about the coefficients to figure out local, local properties of the representation or signal, depending on which way you're going. OK, so anyway, enough of the sort of the pitch for why, why we might want to do something different from these things. So let's sort of bite the bullet and, and define what what wavelets are. OK, so I think I have like nine minutes left, so that's perfect amount of time just to, to start the ball rolling here. So it's a little bit of notation, just a teeny bit of notation. And this is going to be just, a, just sort of like shift but it's scale, OK? So if you're given x, we're, we're assuming, by the way, all signals are complex value. We'll get to that in a second. So given x in c to the r and a bigger than 0, define scale sub a of x to be the signal with specification Scale sub a of x evaluated at time t is just equal to x of a t for all t. Now, we talked the other day about the scaling rule for Fourier transforms. We talked about what it means when, when a is bigger, scale sub a is narrower. When a is smaller, scale sub a is wider. But it shape-wise, it looks like x. And we're going to see this scaling coming in quite a bit when we talk about wavelets. OK, so what is a wavelet? So here's the basic definition. And, and let me tell you, the context we're talking about here, if you, if you Google on wavelets or discrete wavelet transform or any of that, you'll get websites of incredibly varying quality, you know, like especially the Wikipedia pages. But what we're talking about, just to be very specific, is to scratch the surface. What we're going to be talking about, so of wavelet theory, we'll discuss one specific but still rather general circle of ideas. So one specific circle of ideas. And those are what we call dyadic wavelets for signals, complex valued, square integral signals. That's the same as saying L2 signals. And pretty much all the stuff you'll be able to find online is about complex valued L2 signals. And uh, usually it's dyadic. And you'll see what dyadic means in a second. 
So here's the definition. Definition. A wavelet, and this is also known, by the way, in, in the you know, parlance of the theory, quote unquote, a mother wavelet, and you'll see why, because it has many offsprings, many offspring. Offspring has plural offspring, right? Yeah, OK. Mother wavelet is a signal, psi in L2. So it's a complex valued signal, psi in L2, with the following property. If we set for each n and k psi sub k to be the following signal, psi sub k equals scale sub 2 to the k of shift psi sub nk, sorry. Say it's, oh, I forgot a leading coefficient here. Psi sub nk is equal to 2 to the k times scale, so 2 to the minus k, I have to figure that out in a second, S shift sub n of psi, and we'll describe more about what these things mean. So this is for all k and n and z. If we set that to be true, then the set of all those things, psi sub n k, such that n and k are in z, turns out to be a complete orthonormal set in L2. OK, so basically what's going on here is you have this single little thing that if you sh take all its shifts and all its scales by 2 to the k and all the shifts of those scales by integers, you get a whole bunch of signals that all sort of look like it of different heights, but they all sort of look like scaled, shifted versions of it. And together, those constitute a complete orthonormal set in L2. And those are the wavelets associated with the mother wavelet, psi. OK, so let me just make sure I buy that. Yeah, it's 2 to the k shift scale 2 to the k. I always forget whether it's 2 to the, oh, 2 to the k over 2. That's what it is, 2 to the k over 2. All right, so that's the basic definition. Now, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to go through the original, the first wave, the easiest to understand ver example of this, which is known as the Haar wavelet, the Haar mother wavelet and the Haar wave wavelet system. So here's our strategy, what's going to happen. So discuss the Haar wavelets. And these are everyone's first example to learn. And they're due to a um, mathematician who is Hungarian, Balazs. Uh, his name was, was uh, Alfred Haar. And he invented this in 1910. And it, I, I don't think you say it called Alfred because he has the accent. It's like Alfred. So he's probably Alfred or something like that. I don't know. But um, his PhD advisor was actually Hilbert. OK, so Hilbert was his advisor. Anyway, we're going to discuss those. And then we're going to discuss how these are, are a, a, special, a special case of a more general construction. So we look at these as exemplars of an, in a much more general construction called multi-resolution analysis. And that's where we're going to have to leave it. But in so doing, you'll have the skeleton of the theory. And you'll be able to flesh it out, I think, if you want to learn more based on that. OK, so 
anyway, just to give you an idea of what the Haar wavelet is, this is what it looks like. Very simple. So if you take all the shifts of all the scales of this thing, they're all going to be orthonormal if you scale their amplitudes correctly, and they're going to be a complete orthonormal set in L2. So we'll have to start that next time. <laughs>